And welcome, everybody, to the seventh edition of the Deserve to Win podcast. As always, I'm your host, Eric J. Troutman, although you may not recognize me since I'm in a uh, some camouflage today, <laughs> uh, not in my standard uniform. Uh, there's a backstory here. Uh, the ladies made me do it, uh, but we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so as usual, you know, we're here in the beautiful art studio out in Santa Ana. Uh, let's introduce the cast. We'll start with you, PJ. I'm PJ Ganeyan. I... I'm in the call center space and the direct mail space. Uh, how about you, Pooja? Hi, Queenie here. Pooja Amin, uh, co-founder of the Troutman Firm. Yeah, now you work at the Troutman Firm. I love that. I love you saying that instead of working, that you work somewhere else. Although, you're the one that put me up to wearing this suit. You know, I, I love, before before Pooja got here, right, like no one would ever dare to tell the czar what he should wear. I mean, come on, that would be absurd, <laughs> right? Uh, and But now it's like Pooja's here, so she makes suggestions, and then these two are like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I'm like, wait a second, like I've lost control. <laughs> like I can't even, I don't even have like, you know, autonomy in terms of what I'm allowed to look like anymore Wait around here. Wait till I here. start trying to change the firm's name. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, you know, somebody warned me, by the way, that you were going to do this. So anyway, uh, hi, who are you? Hi, guys. Brittany Andres, a.k.a. The Baroness. I'm an associate attorney at the Trauman Firm. Oh, man, she's gotten so good at these introductions. It's fantastic. And how about you, Dame? How are you doing? Uh, I'm Tori Gidry. I'm the Dame of the TCPA uh, world and a Trautman Firm. And I'm also an associate attorney. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, in serious note, though, folks, I was in court today, which is why I'm dressed like this, although I tried to get changed, and it just wasn't going to happen, let me tell you. Uh, we have one other person to introduce you to, although she's not really going to have much to say. She's just like a disembodied head <laughs> floating on a screen. Um, Duchess, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, you have to introduce I yourself. Angelica Munger, and uh. I am a paralegal with the Chapman firm. Yay! We love Angelica. I'm so happy to have you. Uh, you have actually been the person... Uh, and I say this uh, both honestly uh, and gently, that has brought me the most joy since you've started because you're just so nice all the time. I think the TCPA world needs to get like more acquainted with you. You're like a really cool, nice person that people should get to see. Oh, good. My plan's working out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Angela, could you stick around? We might throw a couple questions to you. But for now, let's get to the breaking news, folks. There is a ton to talk about. I know last week we had uh, Joshua Swagger. We talked SIPA. We're not talking any SIPA today. We're talking back to TCPA, our bread and butter. Uh, where do we want to start? Queenie, uh, you know, you, you got me wearing a monkey suit, so why don't you go ahead and, and start today? Sure. For this week, the biggest uh, breakdown or news I have, and Angelica actually blogged about this this week, is November 1st, OTSA went into effect. OTSA? Not FITSA, OTSA. OTSA. OTSA is the new Oklahoma mini TCPA uh, statute, as you folks know, and your TCPA world followers know. Um, it is right in line with the Florida statute, and as you know, the Florida statute is still developing. Um, and Actually, Eric, you just blogged about a FITSA case where uh, Florida actually adopted the Trumpman 9 standards they, they did, within yes. their consent requirements. So we'll keep an eye on that. It'll be really, really interesting to see how uh, Oklahoma courts interpret the mini uh, TCPA statute and whether other states continue to follow suit. Um, I'm keeping an eye on Michigan, too, because that one is the one that scares me the most. Yeah, Michigan is a killer. But yeah. o- OATSA, I like the sound of OATSA because everyone likes oats and oat milk, OATSA. right? But FITSA, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I throw a challenge on that. No one calls it FITSA, it's the FTSA. Uh-huh. Yeah, fair, oh. but the OATSA is just as scary as uh, the FTCA, so keep that in mind. Okay, the Language right. is the same. Uh, it's a cute name, but a dangerous statue. Absolutely. All right, I'm with you. PJ, we're going to go to you. Last week you were like, I don't really have anything to add today, <laughs> I'm just hanging out. What do you got, man? Uh, you were going to do that again, <laughs> weren't you? <laughs> I was going to do it again. He was going to do it again. <laughs> he was. <laughs> You caught me. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting that the previous guests we've had, uh, they look like they're not they're looking for more robocalls. I'm very curious if today's guest is going to be going the same route. I didn't even mention our guest today, which oh, yeah. is crazy. Uh, thank you for that, PJ. Our guest today is Doctor Evil. Doctor Evil, Tom <laughs> Alvord. Uh, no, the guy's famous in TCPA circles. I mean, he found a way to scrub. Uh, against Porch's records and find like hundreds and hundreds of different um, potential claimants. And the real reason he's Dr. Evil is he's created an app, folks, an app where people can come on to the app, complain about a, uh, a spam call, 
but they're not really like complaining to to the entity that made the call. They're actually it's like a bat phone. It goes straight to Tom into Law Law HQ, which is the name of the law firm, um, and it notifies them that they have a potential claim. So as we're gonna hear. I'm pretty sure this guy's got like thousands of clients, and he's up and coming. Now he's a newer guy, uh, but they just had a tremendous win in Chanette, which we're going to talk about here. I think you're, who's going? Someone's going to talk about Chanette here in a second. Um, and so I'm really excited, super excited to have this guy on the show. Uh, I'll tell you, like most of the people we have on the show, I've got like a really deep background with. You know, I, I've known you know Peronic, and I've known Greenwald, and I've known Edelson, and I've known uh, you know Josh. I, mean, I know these guys for for over a decade. This guy's new. Right. Uh, I mean, the czar has known of him, you know, only for a couple of years. We've only tangled a couple of times and really not that substantively. So this is new. I'm going to learn about this guy. I think all of you are going to learn about him quite a bit as well. So I'm really excited for it. He essentially has an app to generate leads. Legal leads is what he's doing. Though. Legal leads? Is, is, but are the legal leads legal is the question. Mm. <clears throat> but that's what he's doing. Yeah. yeah uh, no. Most of the other plaintiff's attorneys are using TikTok. So this guy's light years ahead almost. <laughs> Or behind, depending on how you look at it, I suppose. <laughs> right? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, Does he have a TCP disclaimer on his app? I'm curious. I don't is he calling them? What kind of platform is that he sounds, that, sounds, that, that sounds like the question I would forget to it. ask when the interview <laughs> takes place here in a bit. Uh, all right, let's throw it over you. Thank you for that, PJ. You didn't really give us anything substantive, but you did help the, the, the flow of the podcast. So I have I an appreciate observation, that. too. It seems like uh, robocalls in general have slowed down. Yeah, yeah, it really has. And, you know, I want to take credit for that. Uh, I've decided that I'm the person who stopped more robocalls than any human being alive uh, through my constant efforts to try to help people to comply with the law, understand the law, and the importance of the law. Uh, now, I don't know if really I'm the reason, but I agree with you. I, I think that it has slowed down. I'm going to have to get with uh, my buddy Alex Quilici over at the uh, robocall index and find out if that's true. Not well, the political robocalls, though. Those are up. The text messages are up. There's a lot of suits. The text messages up. are up. Yeah, and it's all up. Uh, uh, a lot like of that. political yeah. companies mm-hmm. are getting sued right now. Yeah, so. and, I, and unless my client is the one sending them, we love you guys, um, that's just terrible. They yeah. should stop immediately. Uh, but if you're my client, then you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, all of my clients operate legally, legally. Um, but no, it's a good point. It does feel as if uh, overall, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a spam filtering, probably not. I, I really do think it's just an overall more of an emphasis in compliance, particularly in the lead gen space. Let's be real, right? We know that lead generators, uh, that industry in particular, uh, has been really just driving a lot of the headache around unwanted calls, not because all lead generators are bad. In fact, Digital Thrive and many mm-hmm. other companies are actually very, very good compliant players, but a lot of folks aren't, and that's just reality. Um, and so, you know, as the, I think the bad guys are slowly getting wilted away, the creation of reach, which we're going to talk to Tom over at Law HQ about here in a minute, I think is really also playing a role already, even though we don't have standards out yet. Just the mere fact that we're constantly socializing uh, the idea of reach and talking it through and that we've now filed, uh, I guess we should announce we've now filed uh, the incorporation papers. We've got the bylaws set up. We're a real life operating entity. Uh, we're building up the board right now as we speak. Um, all of this, I think, is really playing a role in, in getting the bad guys to start. You know, the lights are getting turned on, the cockroaches are scattering, and hopefully here in the next six months to a year, we'll see real continued um, you know, minimization of these unwanted calls. Uh, all right, man, I've got like a neck ache because I've just been looking at you two the whole time, so I'm going to stretch out and turn this direction. Uh, Tori, why don't we start with you? What do you got? Yeah, so Monday morning I wrote about a case that you actually wrote about in 2019. Oh, uh, nice. It's Gino D'Avidio. Um, D'Atavio. D'Atavio. That's I, him. I think. I, I never met the guy. But. Okay. Well, I apologize <laughs> if I'm saying it Versus I'll, I'll stick with Gino. Yeah, there Versus you go. Versus Slack Technologies. So this is a case where he claimed that there was 1,500-something odd text messages sent to him. Slack said... He was the one who sent those text messages to himself. So they sued him in a counterclaim for fraud. Wait, can we just pause? Yeah. I don't feel like you gave that the right emphasis. Okay, Okay, let's try this again. (laughs) How many texts did he get? Uh, 1,590. 1,590. So the lawsuit is for... The lawsuit is for like $750,000 yes. wow. in text messages. Yes. And Slack said what? <laughs> and Slack Technology said he essentially sent those to himself. He set he, up this he, lawsuit. Okay, that's... <laughs> Take, look at the camera and okay. tell the listeners <laughs> this was a set-up lawsuit. This the guy sent 1,590 messages to himself. Try it. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the guy said 1,590 text messages to himself. Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm, okay. I'm impressed, actually. Okay. Can I continue? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Slack countersued for fraud, Wolfham wanton misconduct, um, and also for breach of contract and uh, a breach of the good faith and fair dealing that comes along with a contract. Um, so they were only successful in getting attorney's fees, but that's all they really asked for under each claim. Uh, the only claim that was successful was the breach of contract. The other two, they said they didn't have the requisite damages, and for the uh, good faith and fair dealing, they said it was basically duplicative of the breach of contract claim. What contract? The like. the contract that they consented on whenever they were sending these text me- whenever he was sending these text messages to himself. So he entered into a con- <laughs> Okay, so he went onto a website, right, yes. was using a Slack technology, yes, which and is agreed. a platform, and he selected the yes. terms and the conditions, and he agreed, yes. and that was the contract that they sued him under. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. So I um, I love that case, and I hate that case. <laughs> so when the case was first filed, like back in 2018, uh, Yitzhak Zellman was the plaintiff's lawyer. He's a nice guy. He's been on my mm-hmm. podcast before, a previous iteration. Um, <clears throat> and, and Slack came forward with this evidence that he, the, the plaintiff, had sent himself 1,590 text messages and then turned around and sued Slack for those messages. Uh, and Zellman, you know, to me, tellingly, uh, after that allegation was made, removes himself from the case. He withdraws from the case, mm-hmm. right? But the court refused to dismiss the counterclaim that Slack had filed with all these nice causes of action. Now, you're going to love this, okay? You, you should know this, you, you can't, but you, you didn't bury the, you buried this lead. All, these, all this um, work that Slack did Octavio didn't have a lawyer. Mm-hmm. He couldn't defend himself. He never even filed any papers in opposition. So it was just slack against nobody yeah. showing up in federal court saying, this guy created 1,590. But this is the point. Yeah, They still lost like 90% of their claims. Guys, like, what are we doing? Right? Like, the guy goes onto your website, creates a fake lawsuit with 1,590 text messages, and you can't get him for fraud <clears throat> when he doesn't have a lawyer and he's not opposing your stuff? I gotta tell you, do better, right? I mean, think about Credit One and this Lieberman case. Those guys went out there, great work by those defense lawyers, not me, by the way, I'm complimenting somebody else, not myself, which is very rare. Um, they, they took him in arbitration, they got 200,000 from the guy uh, in fees, and they took got him for another 150, and then like another 75. By the time they were done with the guy, I think he owed like 360,000 bucks to Credit One, who by the way, had made 600 robocalls to the guy, yet, Credit One owes zero. Lieberman owes three hundred and fifty thousand dollars because the allegation goes that he knowingly allowed his phone number to be used by somebody else, right, to set up this claim. Uh, to me, Lieberman's conduct, abysmal though it was, was not as bad as Sla- as as Dectavio, right? <laughs> I mean, who sends messages to themselves and then sues for it? That is craziness. Anyway, um, so Slack, we loved you, but then you just, I don't know, you just, you just let, you dropped the ball, in my opinion. Uh, but he did, they did ultimately get what, like 100k? Um, they said they had 30 days to file back for the attorney's fees. So oh, that's right, they didn't. I don't think we have an exact number yet anywhere on any. That's right, they didn't actually put mm-hmm. forth their attorney's fees, so the that's court correct. gave them the opportunity to do that. Okay, uh, well good breakdown, we're going to work on the mm-hmm. delivery. Uh, you take a case <laughs> like Tatavio, it's a big case, like you've got to really hammer that home. Uh, all right, Brittany, we'll throw it over to you, what do you got? Um, so I want to talk about a case that I recently blogged on TCPA World. If you haven't read it, go read it. It's Capital Link, Man- Capital Link Management. So a man named Ronald uh, sued Capital Link Management for violations of the TCPA. This is a very basic case, so I just want to give a brief uh, breakdown. Um, So he sued for a violation of the TCPA, but before we can even get to the merits of the case, um, and before a defendant can respond, the plaintiff must must personally serve the defendant in the case. Um, Here, Capital Link Management was properly, properly served but he didn't timely respond to the complaint. I don't think he even responded at all. What happens in that case is, um, in that scenario, a plaintiff can file a request for entry of default judgment when a defendant doesn't respond. Here, uh, that's what Ronald did, and before the court can even enter entry of judgment, 
the plaintiff must state a plausible claim for relief in the complaint. Here, the court found that plaintiff didn't even allege um, a proper claim for violations of the TCPA, and the court found the entry of judgment wasn't appropriate. So the other side didn't even show up, and they won. Right. Once again. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love that. It's a fantastic result. Um, but, you know, if you're listening and thinking, well, maybe if I get sued, I just won't show up and I'll walk away with the victory. Uh, probably not. Not the best um, route. Okay, so look, we've got three big developments I want to talk about real, real quick. But uh, look, TCPA world, I love you, but we're throwing out a lot of different channels of information. Uh, and I had a big podcast uh, with, uh, really, it was a webinar uh, with Mike Faree, right? We did a huge compliance update. It's on the YouTube channel right now. All right, so pause, like this video. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe now. And then you can go and find the big Mike Faree compliance uh, breakdown of three huge developments. I'm going to state them really quick, um, but understand there's a huge breakdown on this. We spent 45 minutes talking about it. I don't have time on this show to do that. Um, so number one, the CFPB, right, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is dead. It is dead. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has found that it was illegally funded, unconstitutionally funded from the start by, by the Dodd-Frank Act, and it no longer exists. Uh, specifically, the Fifth Circuit has struck down the payday lending rule, which is a very um, uh, difficult rule for folks to comply with. Uh, it's gone. It's dead. But more broadly, essentially, according to the Fifth Circuit, anything the CFPB has ever done is no longer binding or valid, and it has been completely stripped of any power to act because its only funding source was this illegal perpetual motion machine uh, that ran afoul of the Constitution's uh, Appropriations Clause, again, according to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, there's lots more to that. Obviously, if you're regulated by the CFPB, what do you think about this, Duchess? You're, <laughs> you've got that mortgage background. Is this a big deal that the CFPB just died? What do you think? Yeah. So if you are, thank you. That was really good. See, Tori, take a note. Uh, so if you are regulated by the CFPB, this is huge news. Give us a call. We can kind of talk you through what the impacts uh, of this are on you. Okay, that's one. Second, uh, six Mexican workers. Never thought I'd say that in the t context of a TCPA case. Uh, the Vicalis decision versus Wakefield. Uh, sorry, Wakefield. Well, Vicalis versus Wakefield. That works too. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal has said that that $925 million judgment against Vicalis may have to be reduced under constitutional principles because the TCPA's damages in the aggregate might run afoul of the Due Process Clause. Uh, the Ninth Circuit has adopted a seven-part test under a case called Six Mexican Workers uh, that the district court is now going to have to look at to determine whether or not it wants to reduce the amount of damages that it previously awarded to, against Vaisalas. Now, remember, a jury heard the trial. Uh, the evidence against Vaisalas found that it made a ton of violations and hit it with $925 million was the verdict amount. The judge had previously already been asked on no less than two occasions to set aside the, the judgment uh, and to reduce it. Uh, the judge has also been asked to give him a new trial. The judge was also asked to decertify the case. The judge didn't do any of those things. So the fact that this is going back to that same judge to, to weigh the constitutionality of the award be very interesting to see what happens. More broadly, though, this gives us yet another feather in our cap when we're defending TCPA cases. Maybe, just maybe, the catastrophic damages that we all fear as a defendant in a TCPA class action, maybe they're unconstitutional, Pooja, and then maybe we've got now the ability to argue that a class action is not the superior vehicle to litigate disputes with many class members because obviously if the aggregate damages are too high, yet the individual suits, they wouldn't be too high, you might as well just let these cases come individually as opposed to as a class action and deny certification, at least that would be my argument. All right, last case. We're going to hit it real quick, but it's a very important case because we're going to talk to Jim over at Law HQ Porch. on this. Chinette versus Porch. My God, what a train wreck. <laughs> this is what happens when you make bad arguments to an appellate court. You get destroyed. Uh, and unfortunately, we all have to suffer the consequences. So in that case, uh, we're going to talk about it uh, with, with Jim, the guy who argued the case for the plaintiff. That was a Law HQ case. But the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal uh, held several things. First, it held that the TCPA does apply to business numbers. We know that. Uh, it held that if you put your phone number out publicly, that is not express consent and certainly not express written consent to receive marketing messages, although it might be some form of consent to receive information from consumers if you're a business. And that makes sense. 
Um, the, probably the most damaging part of the ruling from a practical perspective uh, is that it has taken now the burden of proving that you, the phone number on a DNC, uh, on the DNC list is residential from the plaintiff, who used to have to prove as an element of their claim that a phone number is residential before they can sue under uh, 227C. Now that burden has shifted to the defense to prove that if a number is on the DNC list that it is not residential, that in fact it is a commercial number or being used for business purposes. In other words, there's now a rebuttable presumption that never existed before and doesn't exist anywhere else except in the Ninth Circuit that a phone number on the DNC is in fact residential. And last but not least, I feel like I'm talking quick today, but I'm trying to squeeze all this information into your brain's TCPA world as fast as I can. <laughs> um, last but not least, the most important standing doctrine, in my opinion, prudential standing, has been destroyed in the Ninth Circuit because of the Porch case. Prudential standing is the doctrine that says if you are not in the zone of interest that Congress was trying to protect when passing the TCPA, then you cannot bring a suit as a substantive matter on the merits, not just procedurally, you actually lack a substantive claim in that instance. And we use that to very good effect uh, in the Stoops case. My client at that time was Wells Fargo, and we earned the first ever dismissal of a TCPA case on prudential standing grounds in that case, holding that a person who manufactures a lawsuit cannot bring a claim, not just in federal court, anywhere, period. And that was really important case law and the Ninth Circuit just completely destroyed it in the Porch case because Porch argued for some reason that I will never understand that just because a phone number is made publicly available, that an individual or company that lists their number publicly is not within the zone of interest protected by the TCPA and therefore they, ought, they should lose substantively. The Ninth Circuit should have said, I reject that argument. Instead, what it said was, I reject that argument and, because I'm annoyed, probably, there is no such thing as prudential standing in the Ninth Circuit. I'm throwing out the entire concept that you're arguing under, and now there's only two forms of standing, Article Three standing, which we know all about, and statutory standing, which in the context of the TCPA is essentially meaningless because everybody has statutory standing if you're a person or an entity. Um, so that is the breakdown of the three biggest cases that have come out. I kind of went very fast there. Again, watch the special with Mike Faree where I break that down in 45 minutes instead of in 4.5 minutes. Uh, but now let's get back to the good stuff. <laughs> uh, taking a moment to fix myself up here to introduce these fellas. Through the power of the Troutman firm, I'm happy to bring you the guys from Law HQ. You're going to love this. And now, through the power of the Troutman firm, I'm extremely excited to bring on, I guess we'll just call them, what, the Law HQ guys? Uh, we've got Tom and Jim from Law HQ. Fellas, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, really excited for a couple of reasons. One, Law HQ, very cutting edge plaintiff's firm. You guys are causing a lot of noise right now. We're going to talk about that uh, here in a second. But this is the first time I've actually got two lawyers from the same firm to be my guests. So this will be fun. I'm going to have to, like, hop back and forth between the two of you. Uh, but welcome to the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So, Tom, why don't you go ahead and start off, if you wouldn't mind. I think it's your shop, right? Like, uh, give me a, a, just a sense of, of what Law HQ is, kind of what kinds of cases you folks are bringing, what your personal role is, what Jim's role is. Just kind of orient the audience. Sure. So, you know, I, uh, so I graduated with a JD MPA about 10 years ago, and I actually got into marketing. And so I was doing email lead generation for political campaigns, presidential campaigns. So like marketing is my, my bread and butter, right? And uh, my, my past uh, marketing company did really well, number uh, 27 on the Inc. 5000. And, you know, things were going. And, I, you know, this was like 2018, 2019. I was just sick of spam. And I was like, somebody needs to create an app. People can report the spam and then track down and sue them. So I, I, you know, I thought I'm just going to start suing some of, of these spammers, just answering the calls that I was getting. Again, having no clue what I was doing at all, not really having practice law, um, you know, and, and just had a, a few small suits there and then chatting with people. They're like, yeah, go, go do the app. So we went, we created the app. And, you know, three years later, we have about 15 people now. And, uh, so our, our, our company's set up a little different, right? So we have a whole tech component where users 
and consumers can report any of their calls, text messages, voicemails as spam. We then have a whole investigative division who track down the identity of who's spamming because a lot of these people hide their identity. Uh, and then we have a legal team which you know prosecutes and and uh, brings the litigation. And and so that's where Jim fits in. He's the the head of uh, our litigation team. Fascinating. So you folks are actually an app, right? Like your your primary model for bringing in plaintiffs is an app. What's the app called? Uh, Caller HQ. So like Law HQ, but Caller HQ. Caller HQ. And then uh, can you get that on like the Apple Store or? or yeah, Apple Store, Android, Android Store. It's free for download, and you download it and start reporting spam, and we'll start tracking down the spammers. So now here's the important question: Did you develop the app yourself, Tom, or did you go with the outfit to put that together for you? Uh, so all of our developers are in-house. So so everything we've developed, we've developed from scratch, uh, from the Android app to the iOS app to the back office, to our whole CRM, you know, because there wasn't really anything that would allow us to track. And I, you know, every day we have thou literally thousands of new calls, text messages, voicemails coming in that our investigative team is filtering through, looking at. And, you know, where we're at now and, and some of the AI we've built, probably 30 to 50 percent of all of the spam, we already know who the spammers are. So it's just a matter of time for us to, you know, Get, get to the cases. We, we actually are sitting on so many cases. It, Jim, uh, Jim's begging that we hire some more attorneys. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, well, don't get your eye over here, okay? <laughs> these, these ladies are spoken for. Um, so, so once the app is utilized, the consumer presses a little button, right, and says, spam, complaint. What, what's it say? What's the button actually say? Uh, you, you just swipe left, and then you can put a little note about whether you know who the spammer is, whether you have ever done business with them. And then from there, uh, right now, it doesn't tell them anything. It just, you know, they can see that it's reported and they and it shows up in the app as in their spam folder. So Brittany, help me out. Swiping left means you like it or you don't like it? I don't, I don't know about these swiping things. Is this good or Le bad? I think left. not like it. Not like left it. Left is not like right it. Is yeah. like, right is like. Right, right yeah. is like? Yes. Okay. So you're going to swipe left. You're going to say, I don't like you. Uh, next, um, and then that does a notification to LightHQ, uh, and I love it, Tom. So you're just kind of sitting back now. You've got this cool app. People are utilizing it, and it's essentially a referral source of lawsuits for you. And then this guy Jim uh, takes over. Uh, Jim, are you suffering? You got too many cases. What's going on? <laughs> uh, let's just say we have plenty to do. I said to Thomas today, he said I could work half days, any twelve hours I wanted. So uh, we have uh, we have a lot to do. That's exactly right. I tell my team that, look, it's a weekend. You can work half a day. You choose what 12 hours. It's fine with me, right? Now, of course, during the week, it's 19-hour days. I mean, come on. Uh, but in seriousness, you guys have come to my attention for a couple of reasons. And, and Tom, I want to talk to you about one thing. And then, Jim, I'm going to talk to you about something else. Uh, and Tom, you know, look, if you can't talk about this or you feel like it's a little uh, you know, sensitive, I respect that. But I, I've noticed that you've had some battles with um, certain, uh, shall we call them, uh, agencies uh, over the use of the phrase Law HQ as the name of a functioning law firm. Uh, and it's you know slowly becoming, I think, more obvious to people that I'm also having concerns about a certain law firm that is using a certain name, i.e. my name. I don't like it. Um, so tell me about that, Tom, if you can. Yeah. So, you know, when we started, it, it's interesting. So there's kind of two things. When I, when I started the firm, I thought, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be just focused on telephone spam. And, and at the time, I was thinking, you know, in five to 10 years, I, I think with government, what, with what the government's doing and, and you know, just other things happening, you know, telephone spam won't be an issue five, 10 years from now. I, I don't think that's the issue. I, I don't think things are going to change. And, and, and I think we actually have more and more companies uh, employing Twilio and other programmatic, you know, very simple ways to implement text messages and, and calls into your business. And, you know, sometimes businesses don't realize, oh, I needed to get this type of consent or I needed to do that. Now, there are the spammers who they're just spamming the heck out of everyone and they don't care. There's other people who they probably know, but they're kind of gray hat towing the line. And then there's other people, that they just made a mistake, right? It, but But I don't think it's going anywhere. But with all that said, I wanted something that was generic, and there's kind of a whole vision and mission for Law HQ outside of the telephone spam, 
with with this being kind of our core. But with Law HQ, uh, you know, some state bars prohibited law firms from using a trade name. So I, you know, the firm would need to be Alvord Law LLC or something like that, right? Um, I, I had joked around with my wife, hey, what if I change my last name to Law or my last name to HQ and then we're good? I thought it was funny. She thought it was a horrible idea. So I didn't do that. Um, but in any case, we thought, okay, there's nine state bars that still require the firm name to have the name of a partner in it. Does it have to be so, a current partner or it could be a dead partner that died? I, it could be a dead partner. Yeah. Dead partner's okay? Yeah. All right, carry on. <laughs> so we reached out to the nine state bars and said, hey, if we operate in the state, we just want an assurance that you won't you know, bring some disciplinary action. And only one responded saying, I'll get back to you. All the others ignored us. And so we thought, OK, well, you know, if we're bringing on other attorneys or working with other attorneys and some relationship, we, we don't want them getting in trouble. So we're like, OK, well, I, I guess we got to sue the state bars. So we went and, and, and part of it is like, look, we're a startup. We need to be cognizant of cost. But because it's a violation of the Constitution, right, free speech, you know, we, we could get our fees. Um, so we hired another individual to work with us on this. And I thought, hey, you know, if a few of these, I, I, I was confident we'd prevail on all of them, we'd get our fees. So we'd both make some money and kind of change the law. Well, we went and we filed the suits and one by one, they each just changed their rule. Well, if, if you change your rule, you haven't technically won. It now becomes moot. And so, I mean, we got nine state bars to change their rule. But we never I think it was actually the Supreme Court of Ohio. I want to guess where, where Jim's out. I want to say where, where Jim's out of. They had voted five to four to change their rule. I, I wish there would have been one that we could have just, you know, uh, proceeded with. So, you know, that that's where we did, uh, you know, th those suits. And I think it took a year or so and they all changed, which is it's kind of frustrating that you wait so long. Right. No one responds. But then once put, you know, it, it finally comes to it. They're like, oh, we'll all just change our rule. So anyways, now any firm nationwide can operate using a trade. Yeah, I was going to say, so the actual rule change is the result, right? Frankly, the, the world changing, the legal profession changing result is that now law firms can call themselves whatever they want. Yeah. And you could operate in whatever state. I mean, again, 41 states already had that rule, but nine states still were holdups. Well, so good for you, Tom. First of all, that's a remarkable accomplishment. You should be proud of yourself. If you don't do anything else in your career and on the trajectory you're on, you might not. I'm kidding. Uh, but in seriousness, if you do nothing else in your career, man, that's that's actually a pretty huge and, and momentous thing that you've accomplished already. Now, unfortunately, from my perspective, that means that the firms using my name can just keep right on doing that. And I just don't appreciate that very much. I was hoping they would have a different outcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I guess we'll just have to live on. Uh, well, no, I appreciate that story. Uh, and so the other thing I want to talk with you about before we talk about reach, which we're going to talk about here in a second as well. Um, and Jim, I'm going to talk to you about this is you guys had a case. And again, if you can't talk about it or you've got to kind of, you know, punt on some questions, I, I respect that. But I'm going to ask you um, this case, uh, Jeanette versus Porch uh, out in the Ninth Circuit. That was your case, right? Yes, sir. Did you argue that yourself? I did. Um, tell me all about it, man. No, um, the, the, you know, the, the nice thing is that I, I have been practicing a long time and for 30 years I was on the defense side. So I know exactly what you guys are thinking and what your clients are thinking. So I, I have that bigger thing. Not, not even God knows what I'm thinking, man. Come on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, 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 was, it was really, a, it, it's really a cool thing to, to be able to argue a case in a, in a significant circuit where there's no law in the area. Right. There have been no real uh, circuit court decisions on uh, what is a residential phone uh, under 227C. And, uh, you know, our position, my position was, and I think the court found uh, accordingly, that the, the FCC has basically said a resident, you know, a phone on, on the do not call registry is presumed to be a residential line. Uh, and there can be other factors that come into play that you get that are looked at as to whether it, uh, it somehow becomes a business line 
uh, not really clear where that line is drawn even still, but uh, I think it was a significant ruling by the Ninth Circuit to say a phone on the do not call registry is a residential line, even if it has a business component to it. Yeah, I and mean, there was actually a lot of pieces to this case. We were talking about it earlier in the show, and you know, just to kind of level set again, um, you know, one of the things that that porch argued, and, that, and you know, correct me if you think I'm wrong. I think it played into your hands. I think it made the Ninth Circuit more likely to rule in your favor. Uh, was essentially they were arguing one, there's no standing at all if you have a business line. The TCPA just doesn't apply to business numbers, which is, in my opinion, that's just an absurd argument. A secondary argument, which was not quite as absurd, but still to me pretty far-fetched was the concept that just because somebody put their number out there publicly that that somehow constituted express consent under the TCPA or perhaps even express written consent somehow uh, or express written permission under the DNC rules which I mean I, I didn't get that I mean did, when you saw those arguments did you think oh man this is going to be a steamroller we're going to crush these guys or kind of what was your thinking well you know when I read the when I read the Idaho court opinion I thought what am I missing here? I, I've read the statute. I don't quite get where they're coming from. Uh, and, and then, as you say, Porch decided to continue to pursue that argument in, in the Ninth Circuit. I, I was I was kind of baffled. Um, you know, I, I don't often think I have, a, you know, a, a clear cut winner. But on this one, I, I couldn't see any court finding the way Porch and the, and the Idaho court had, had found. Um, but you know, I've been around long enough to know you never know what a court's going to find. And, you know, you read you read those arguments and you go, this makes no sense. The statute says something different. What am I missing? Uh, and those are sometimes the most scary ones because you think, how can, how can this, you know, credible law firm argue these things? Indeed. Indeed. Um, so that, of course, once you, once you left that hurdle, that brought up the, the business versus residential distinction. And I hate you, uh, Jim, I'm gonna tell you, I hate you because uh, you've accomplished something that is, is just awful. Uh, it's counterintuitive. And in my opinion, it's contrary to the law, which as you know, well, as a plaintiff, right, you have the burden of proof on every single element of your claim. And whether or not a number is residential is an element of your claim. You have to prove that in order to win, except not in the Ninth Circuit anymore. Uh, how did you pull off essentially taking your burden of proof and sticking it on the defendant's shoulders. Well, I, I, I told Tom, as I've heard some, from various people that they hate me on the defense side, and I said, that just brings me incredible joy. But, um, you know, I, I think that, I, I think I would disagree with your with your proposition, right? So, I mean, yes, but there, there are burdens of proof that shift, you know, there are presumptions and cases in the law everywhere. Right there, that's not an unusual thing to have in the law, and we still have our burden to prove that it was registered on the do not call registry. Right, the the question then becomes is what is the effect of that in in regard to whether it's a residential line? And I think that's where the court came down exactly how the FCC has come down, which is if it's on the do not call registry, it's presumed to be residential. Yeah. I guess. Uh, I mean, I just struggle with that because, I mean, just because a number is put onto the DNC, that doesn't presume anything, right? I mean, I, I don't I don't understand how you can take the fact that somebody put a number on a list and say, I'm going to presume as a matter of law, therefore, that that's a residential number. I just struggle. I struggle with that. And, and I could be wrong, but the FCC has never ex explicitly held that. Uh, correct. This was the the Ninth Circuit essentially kind of putting that together on its own. No, I I think the FCC has said numerous times in various rulings that a number on the do not call registry is presumed to be residential. And um, you know, you 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 say how can that be? You know, I mean, the purpose of the do not call registry, in my humble opinion, is to protect people who want to take the time to list their number on a on a in a in a you know database that says don't call me and don't bother me. Um, and most people who have pure business lines obviously don't want to do that, right? So the logic is that if you've taken the time, if you've made the effort, if you you know if you don't want to get called and you take your time to put it there, 
it's presumed to be residential. You know, the fact that we have a law that now has cell phones being used by a large portion of the population as their residential line just reinforces that in my mind. All right, look, fair enough, man. Um, I'm gonna pivot off of that to the last piece of the case, which to me was actually the single most damaging. I mean, again, the, the shift in burden, that's a big deal. But to me, the most damaging piece of the case, and I'm wondering if you even realized what you did here, Jim. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, we're gonna find out. Is that the uh, Ninth Circuit has collapsed the idea of prudential standing as to merely a component of statutory standing and essentially destroyed it. I mean, it's, it's like disappeared into like a singularity, right? It doesn't exist anymore, prudential standing. Uh, and this is near and dear to my heart, as you fellows may know, right, is I, I obtained the first ever uh, post-Genesis Article 3, uh, post-Spokio Article 3 dismissal of a TCPA class action, and a secondary component of that ruling uh, was a prudential standing dismissal that operated on the merits, right, with prejudice, uh, in the instance of a consumer who had uh, manufactured her own lawsuit, in that case by buying 86 cell phones, right? We argued that there was no prudential standing for such an individual to bring a suit because she was outside the zone of interest of the statute. Uh, now, again, and I, I don't want to pile too much on Portis lawyers, but in my opinion, this was not a great decision that they would raise prudential standing in the context of well, hey, somebody put their phone number out there publicly, so they're outside the zone of interest of the TCPA. Again, that's that's just a silly argument. Um, but I, I really feel like what the Ninth Circuit should have done is said, that's a silly argument denied. And instead what they did was say, we don't believe in prudential standing. It's gone forever. There's only Article Three and statutory standing now in the Ninth Circuit. And to me, that is, one, a massive error in law, but two, and most importantly, really opens the door up to, to, you know, manufactured claims in a way that didn't exist before. So I was just kind of curious, I mean, were you surprised by that component of the ruling? Were you driving for that result? It didn't seem like you were in the papers, but go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I, I often go to Thomas and I, and I say, you know, I, I, am, I hate the Facebook decision. And I hate the Facebook decision not because I think it was ultimately decided wrong on the facts given to the court, but because it was a stupid case to bring to the Supreme Court on that issue for the plaintiff, right? You, you know, if you give your number to someone, it's really hard to argue with a straight face that it's random. And, uh, you know, I, I, it just wouldn't be a decision that I would have, have gone with. But, you know, the, the court, I think, took the facts and the argument that Porch made. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I did not think it was a very well-crafted argument and ended up with a probably a broader decision than than it would have liked uh, on an issue that that it you know uh, still is still is uh, as you say can comport it together uh, prudential and understanding um, and statutory standing. So I, I think you know it was it was what we were arguing in that sense of the facts of the case. Uh, I, I was happy with the way the court found the decision, wrote the decision. Well, I was very unhappy about it, uh, Jim, and I, I don't appreciate it. But you know what? Good for you guys. I mean, look, I I am not one of these lawyers that, as you probably detected, right? Like, I don't hate the plaintiff's bar. In fact, to a large degree, I respect the plaintiff's bar. Uh, you guys are creative as hell, uh, and many times you outclass the defense bar. Uh, in fact, I mean, kind of day in, day out, I'd say the plaintiff's bar demonstrates more creativity and effectiveness as advocates than the defense bar does. Myself excluded, of course. Um, but no, Jim, it was a great win, and, and you should be proud of yourself, and I know that you are. Um, I just wish that just wish that last piece hadn't been decided quite the way it had been. It's just, it's just unfortunate. Um, but Tom, I want to pick it back over to you and ask you a couple of questions. And again, you know, same caveats as before. If you feel like I'm pressing too close, you don't want to, you don't want to answer the question, you can't. I, I respect that. But the people that listen to my show love it when I ask questions like this. Right? You're going to like this. Like, what is your business model? Um, I, I know that you are, obviously with your app, right, you're going to have huge volume available to you. It sounds like what you're telling me is you are working with investigators not just to identify who is sending the text, but to find maybe like your best cases and then you're kind of like a flight to quality. You're only filing a handful that are actually your best cases and your model is to pursue them all the way to the hill. But I don't know. I mean, you know, we've had Adrian Bacon on here. They've got kind of a different model. Lots of lawyers have different models. You know, if you're if you're talking to one of my clients or the folks that listen to this show that might actually be a target of one of your lawsuits one day, 
you know, what do you want them to know about how you litigate your cases? And, and when you say people listening, are you talking about like on the defense bar? Oh, you've got people on the defense bar, the plaintiff's bar. I mean, understand, this is the Deserve to Win podcast in tcpaworld.com. Of course, we've got a vast following. In fact, we've got several regulators, folks at the FCC, the FTC, the AG's office. But what I'm talking about really are the core people in my audience who are call centers, right? Who are folks who are trying to comply with the law, uh, but for various reasons that we're going to talk about here in, in a bit, it, it can be very challenging to do so. And they're going to face a lawsuit. And maybe Law HQ is new to them, right? Maybe they don't know this Tom guy. Who's Tom Albert? I don't know this guy. Um, and so watching this podcast for many people is their first chance to kind of hear about you, learn about you, know who you are, know what your, your firm is about. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I, I know like Peronic likes to kind of toot his horn. Greenwald always at least pretends to be humble, although we know he's got an ego. Uh, Edelson's the same way. Like he just loves talking about how smart he is. Uh, so I figured I'd give you an opportunity and just kind of, you know, set your own brand out there for the folks that, you know, frankly, you might be suing one day. Yeah. So I, I would say, well, so, so there's two things, right? There's there's the business model, but then also the objective. And one of our core objectives is legitimately to stop spammers. In the last couple of weeks, we have talked with uh, a couple defendants, defense counsel that we have class actions against. And we've told them, look, we're open to discussing a settlement. Uh, generally speaking, we're not going to settle unless it's on a class-wide basis. So it's like, look, we're, we're just not going to do it. I, I know there's other firms and it, it's just a paper mill, right? And, and they just, you know, they just send out so many complaints. Um, and and I, I, it seems like all they've done is change the defendant's name, right? And and the plaintiff's name. And, it, and it's, it's like, I, I, I look at them, I'm like, I would be happy if I was a defense counsel because there's hardly any facts. There's nothing in there, you know, but but they get quick settlements, right? That is absolutely not our model. Our model is we our our mission is to stop spammers, which which I think even people on the defense bar, unless you're actually defending these people, probably support, right? Because it actually diminishes the value of the calls and the text messages that have consent that are legitimate because people just don't answer. I mean, I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but we have some clients who have so much spam that when we reach out to them and send them a text message, they're like, oh, I didn't realize it was you guys. I thought it was spam. Just everything I get is spam, right? Because they get 20 text messages a day, right? And so we understand, right? I, you know, it, it's not all about money. I'll, I'll share this too. And, and, and Jim has heard me say this probably since he's come on over a year ago. I'm cognizant of the fact that people have businesses, they have their families, they have employees, right? Our goal is not to like just destroy somebody. But when I see somebody who keeps spamming, I really don't have any sympathy. And I'm like, oh, I don't care if you go bankrupt. And if you want to, you know, I'll, I'll contest it in bankruptcy. And even if we don't get it uh, discharged, uh, we still have more spam and we'll go after you, right? Like I, I want people to absolutely fear spamming, knowing why HQ is going to come after them. So as I was mentioning before we started here, there's some of these spammers. We we have hundreds of clients who have spam from them. And, and it also makes it hard, right? And, and we might bring those on an individual basis saying, look, it's not even a class because your damages already are $10 million, right? Uh, you don't have some big business. You're not publicly traded. There's no way I'm okay that you keep spamming. And some of these people, because we can extrapolate our data, it's like, I know you're spamming, sending out billions of text messages a year. So I'm going to do whatever I can to make your life miserable. And if you're penitent and say, hey, you know what, game over, I give up, I'm going to stop, then I'm saying, okay, I, you know, let, let's see how we can, how we can resolve this. So, um, you know, that, that's how I kind of view that. And our, again, our focus is so different. I view ourselves as like a true private attorney general, not, not that other people aren't, but we are uncovering spammers. One of my favorite suits that we have right now is in the Southern District or Central District of California. Oh, Jim, you know, I'm a marketer. I'm an entrepreneur. I just go out there. I just do whatever. I'm like, ah, don't worry. Just go. Jim's like, no, calm down. No, you can't do that. Don't say that. Um, 
But for me, that suit, he, he, so Spam Host is a website, well, a, an entity that basically monitors like 3 billion email inboxes, Gmail, Yahoo, you name it, right? They have tons and tons of analytics and data on email spammers. The number two email spammer, and just depending on the, the time frame, other times number one email spammer in the world, and then number two in the world, so one in the US, two in the world, sorry, is a guy named Michael Bohm. The guy has been spamming like crazy. <laughs> Every day we get new users reporting spam. We got spam from, we, we've told them, look, we, we, we have more spam. And so, I mean, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But no other, he's never been sued before. No, no one's tracked him down. We, we had to file a John Doe suit, send out about 36 subpoenas that basically all pointed back to him. So, so we found our guy. So again, we, we really are tracking down these spammers in, in a very substantially different way than other people have done. And like our head of, of uh, our investigative division, he's worked with the military for 20 plus years tracking down terrorists and stuff. So, you know, we, we really focus on how do we actually stop this really, really bad spam. Uh, I love hearing that background. That's exactly the sort of thing that I love being, bringing people on time. I didn't know half of that at least. Uh, but let me ask you, let me, let me push back on a couple of things and ask you. Um, so first, from my perspective, and I'm the czar, so my perspective matters, um, you're kind of new to this game, John, uh, Tom. You're, you're, you're not like a, a Johnny come lately, but you are newer on the block. I mean, you're not a Josh Swagger, you're not an Adelson, you're not a, you know, even a Greenwald's been around right, for over a decade now. Um, so, you know, if if you're a major institution and you see Law HQ, you're first probably thinking to yourself, what the hell's a Law HQ? Uh, second, you're probably thinking, this is a way, you know, the defense lawyers and, and many times in-house counsel will think, do these guys have the guns? Do they have the war chest, right, to do a battle of attrition and actually get all the way to certification and see it through? And truthfully, Tom, I'm I'm curious about that too. What's your response? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, you I, you I, say gems like Thomas. You're you're talking too much. Simmer <laughs> down. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say two things. One is, um, one of the one of our you know you asked our our business model and and again I I did defense work for 30 37 years and I would get complaints in and I would say yeah. You know, same old stuff. I've seen it. There's nothing here that scares me. But I would get complaints in from really good plaintiffs attorney, and I would go, oh, you know, shoot, this is something that really scares me and should scare my client. Those are the kind of cases we like to file. We try and file. And, you know, we have done much deeper and much what, you know, deeper homework on facts and, and what's going on before we file the suit. And, you know, if if defendants don't take us seriously, they will. Okay, I respect that. Uh, anything you want to add there, Tom? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to remember the, so so you, you mentioned uh, war trust. What, what was the other? Just you got the guns. I mean, you know how this works, oh, right? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you know, um, I, I I'm okay being wrong and 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 you know seeing something different, but I I hate losing. I love to win, right? I'm so so for me, you know, people might not know who we are, and, and I'll just throw this out there just for kicks and giggles, I suppose. The porch suit started off as a small claims complaint. Didn't know that. And so that's where they said, hey, your client opted in. He has an arbitration clause. I'm sending it from my personal Gmail on some dinky small claims complaint. So yeah, they're probably thinking, hey, there's nothing here. What people don't know is I will dive in day in, day out. I, I literally wake up thinking, oh, what was that 11th Circuit case? And go down and start researching, right? When I'm going to bed. So yeah, I, I don't have the legal acumen so to speak in terms of certifying a class or you know doing depositions you know that's why i got jim and, and a legal team but every i mean i i've probably read 47 usc 227 at least a thousand times probably ten thousand times i i wish google could tell me how many times i've googled it i mean it's amazing you probably know this you go and you're like holy crap i never 
how did I never see that comma there or that word there, right? And it's like, oh my goodness. Well, it's funny because yeah. last night Fujio was, was texting me saying, I didn't realize that there was a difference between 227A2 and 227D. And I was like, come on now. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. What were you saying, James? No, I was just uh, I was just wondering if you had the button for Thomas, but uh, you know I, I I think that you know like I said I've been doing this a very long time and and been in some pretty high stakes litigation over the years, um, and I I've learned one thing and that is never to take an opponent lightly, no matter who they are, because there's some really good lawyers out there that are not maybe as well known as others that have won some really significant decisions such as the Chinette case. So I, and, and for anyone who, who like, I don't know if any of you like soccer, right? My 11 year old son's a big Manchester City fan, right? They're like top class in, in uh, England. And, and they're in the you know UEFA's Champions League, which is the top league in the world with all the top European teams. I mean, and they're just dominating everybody, right? And, and and the press conference after, and this was just like two weeks ago, and I loved it. It, it just stayed with me, and it kind of goes along with what Jim's saying. He's like, man, you guys, how did it feel coming in? You're just going to cream them. And he's like, you know, we came in, and we respected our opponent. They're a good team. And so because we had that humility or that respect, so now, and, and, and you know, not that everyone interacts with different types of attorneys, right? So, you know, we are the new kid on the block or a new kid on the block, I guess, you know, uh, but, but I, you know, I, I would second what Jim says, but I would add one other thing. Maybe what I don't have in the legal, I would say, if I'm allowed to toot my own horn, I could run circles around people and understanding the marketing and what's happening, right? I mean, I was, uh, what was the entity? It was the entity that ran Mitt Romney's presidential campaign, right? Uh, and 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 they work with with a lot of different Republican campaigns. And and this was right before I started my marketing company in 2014. And they're like, hey, you know, we're doing lead gen because I had to reach out to a governor, the the governor of Texas, saying, hey, I'd be happy to do some lead gen. And it, it was just me doing stuff. And you know, they're like, hey, our cost per lead is X. And I had a way to generate legitimate leads, running Facebook, spending, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars generating leads, you know, at a dollar less than they were getting. So I, I know the marketing inside and out. I have my own affiliate network that we run with our marketing company. So because of that, I, I think that brings a value, especially when it comes to the affiliate marketing world. Jim talks about, man, these people don't do homework, right? And and it just makes me kind of cringe and feel kind of bad. It's like, man, here's this suit that went on for two years just for the court to say, shucks, you got the wrong person. It wasn't the advertiser. It wasn't the affiliate network. It wasn't the publisher. It was the sub-publisher, and they're not operating anymore, right? So, I mean, we really, really dig deep to figure out who's doing this. And so that's where I think, you know, it makes us probably a little more dangerous. Are you worried with your affiliate network and with your app that does drive text messages? Are you worried about getting sued under the TCPA? Are you using the reassigned number database? Like, what are you, what are you doing to avoid liability? Yeah, so the affiliate network is only for um, my, my marketing company. And and that was limited to the crowdfunding space like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, if you're familiar with that. And, and that's kind of died down over the last few years, uh, you know, because whatever the market gives you is kind of what play box you have to or playground you have to, to operate in. Um, so I'm, I'm not really too worried with that. I, I don't see I, I don't think anyone I, I've never even gotten one complaint or anything in, in terms of us messaging people. Um, you know, we haven't. Just because our operation isn't so big, uh, you know, we we have thousands of clients, but it's not like hundreds of thousands or millions, which is what our plan is to get to. Um, right now, any message we send, it is one on one, right? That there is no auto dialer, and, and, and I will say, right, it's kind of anyone who knows any type of industry, right? You you, you know the ugly parts of it, and it's like, okay, <laughs> I want to be really careful for for what we send. And one of the things that is disappointing, and maybe this is the case in any area of the law, but 
I, I, I wish there was more clarity around so many different things because it, it actually is not really fair in a sense to businesses where you don't know, hey, what's going to happen here? Uh, you know, we were talking about the, the do not call registry. It's unfortunate the FCC didn't give clear guidance back in, was it 2016 in the Banks case with the Second Circuit where they said, hey, tell us what a residential number is in the FCC. I mean, it was the same thing with Facebook, right? There was what, two petition, hey, what's an auto dialer? Ah, uh, well, we, 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 we got the business lobby and the consumer lobby. Let's just let's just sit here and say nothing. Um, so so, you know, I, I'm not really too worried because, you know, I, I make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's. But, you know, it, it is. Kind of different. It's, 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 it's funny the way, Tom, and I say this with love, like your body language changed, right? You had like all this great confidence throughout. And I ask you that question and you're like, I'm not really that worried about it. Right. And you kind of shrivel up. It's the same way my clients are. I mean, that's why I'm trying. That's why I asked the question, because. You know, these are great you know, leaders in the industry. You know, many of these people are, are very sophisticated, well-educated, very powerful, huge networks, huge net worth. And then you ask them about the TCPA, and it's the exact same shrivel, right? Like, well, everything's fine. Um, and so, but you're a very interesting character, Tom, because not very many people see both sides of it the way you do, right? And that well, well see, and, and that's the thing, right? A law firm is a business, right? Uh, I mean, right out of the gate, any, any law firm is pro, should be pro-business, right? You, you are a business. And, and, you know, my, my marketing company, we worked with probably three to four thousand different startups. So, you know, my I, I mean, I, I I consider myself, you know, Republican, libertarian, independent, generally speaking. Right. So, you know, maybe being on the plaintiff side is um, I, ironic. At the same time, I suppose it's a business opportunity. Not that I want to manufacture <laughs> suits. But if people are sick of this spam, I mean, we, we literally have people time and again. I mean, I, I know you, you've dubbed me Dr. Evil, so I, I guess I'll take that as a compliment if it's from the, the defense bar. But we've had people, I'm not kidding, who say you're doing the Lord's work. You're doing God's work. I mean, because they feel absolutely frustrated that nothing is getting done. And, and again, I think a lot of this, I mean, some of it could be people who are your clients, right? Could be Fortune 500 companies, but there's a lot of the spam. And this is also what I'm like so excited about. I think we legitimately can make a significant dent. You know, the data shows that I think it was last year that consumers receive more spam text messages than spam calls, right? Because people aren't answering their phone if they don't know who's calling because it's usually a spammer. And they just let it go to voicemail. And so the way these people, you know, are, are reaching people is through text messages. And, and they're just so frustrated that they're just inundated day in, day out. And where, you know, our, our lead investigator says, I love coming in in the morning because I can see that 30, 40 percent of all this SMS spam, we already have identified who it is or the affiliate network it's going through. So I'm hopeful within 12 to 24 months, a lot of these bad, bad actors, we like literally we could have an impact of reducing like 40 billion plus spam text messages. Now, of course, if they go underground or do other stuff or don't show up or just default, which is a lot of the shady people do. I mean, I, I will try to lobby the government to like put in criminal charges and prison time if, if I can't get it some way because I legit want it to stop. And that's why, Tom, you came to me to begin with. And let's pop, pivot over to Reach because you just said, you know, you want to try to stop 40 billion calls, but it's whack-a-mole for you, right? Well, guess what? I sit on the defense side, right? I've got the entire TCPA world is my fiefdom as the czar. Uh, and all the call centers, all the big enterprises, all the direct con consumer marketers, they all know me. They all respect me, I think, most of the, well, at least most of them. Um, and so we've created, as you've heard, uh, Reach. Right, the responsible enterprises against consumer harassment. It exists for one primary purpose, which is to stop unwanted robocalls. And stopping unwanted robocalls has many benefits to society, not just, of course, to consumers who don't want the calls, but also, as you alluded to earlier, Tom, you're completely correct, right? 
our the the, the um, call answer rates are so low right now that the value of that legitimate contact that that consumer asks for and wants it's gone down and down and down. The ability to reach out to that customer has become so difficult. The carriers now have been given these black box licensing schemes, totally unconstitutional, uh, but they're empowered to do this because the problem isn't being solved by business. And of course, my goal is to get the business leaders together and to actually put a stop to this by requiring that the lead suppliers meet certain thresholds to avoid any fraud and to make sure that the consumer is fully empowered and completely knowledgeable regarding what is going to happen next when they click that yes I agree button. So there's no question that they're going to receive calls from five people or three people or if there's going to be an aged lead that they might receive calls 90 days. Or 100 wait, days. wait, you're telling me that there can't be a, a hyperlink that says you're going to get messages and then it lists 700 companies? No, there probably can be. And, and truthfully, under the law right now, Tom, that is legal. And what I'm talking about is creating I know, I, 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 I'm just playing with you. I, I totally agree. I just know we've we've interacted with defendants where it's like, oh, they often on this page. It's like, who in their right mind would submit their information on this where there's this obscure hyperlink that you click on? And I'm not kidding. There's over a, th a thousand different companies listed saying you could read. I'm like. So we've got to get to a place where the standards that business are holding itself to are higher than the strict legal standards that exist. Because the legal standards say that hyperlink with 7,000 people, that is enforceable, right? That, that's an enforceable disclosure. But that doesn't give that consumer the level of consent and transparency that they want because when that individual company, who they actually probably did consent to receive calls from, starts calling them, they perceive that as something they don't want. They perceive that as a likely violation and as spam, right? And I'll tell you, the company making that call probably doesn't know that the only reason it's making that call is because it's you know number 685 on a list of 700 people on a form that was supposed to be for solar, and they're selling auto insurance, right? You know that the value of that lead is 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 nothing. The impact to society is net negative, right? And the goal of this organization is to get everybody's interests aligned. Because, in my opinion, direct consumer marketer marketing does have a place in this country. It does serve a value, particularly uh, in things like the mortgage vertical, where people don't want to just, you know, get a home loan over over an app, right? I know Rocket thinks that that everybody wants a home loan over an app, but there's a lot of people that don't want that. They want to be able to talk to somebody, and the uh, and, and there's a space for direct consumer marketing that really is valuable. Um, so anyway, you reached out to me, Tom, and I appreciate this because now we're creating the board right now. The entity is live. We've got bylaws. I'm, I'm soliciting board members. And you reached out and you said, I want to be a board member. Uh, and I love that. Uh, and what I told you was, uh, was, was yes and no, right? We're going to have a primary board that is going to actually be made up of the lead buyers, right? Because we need buy-in from all the large players who are going to agree that we're going to abide by these standards, right? Because if any one person or a large company is going to cheat, right, then they're going to get the business benefit of that because everybody else now is going to hold back and only pay for very specific sorts of leads and, and not engage in, in abusive practices. So if, if one person goes, they get the benefit, right? So we're trying to avoid it so nobody gets that benefit. Everyone behaves. But I'm not going to lie. I don't know everything myself. So I want an advisory board of plaintiff's lawyers, right? People who are real wonks, People like you, actually, who actually have also that wonderful background in mar marketing. Man, Tom, you're going to be a real asset to this thing. Hopefully. We'll see. Okay, well, that was your opportunity to tell me how you're going to be a real asset to this thing. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, I, I agree there, there has to be buy-in, right? And, you know, you, you just have a few bad actors and, and it kind of ruins everything um you know i i, I think the approach to stopping I, I mean i look at myself as helping companies comply they, they just got to pay a lot more money um than you know if a, a defense attorney was was perhaps doing it but you know i i think it's a multi-faceted approach right um and, and just on a tangent I agree. It's frustrating with what the carriers are doing, especially the 10 digit long code. We, we, I mean, you, you've probably had clients. We, we, you know, we have our SMS system. 
that we manually send messages to just communicate with our clients because it's easy, it's quick. And I'm like, why, why is nobody responding to us? Like, did, did we offend everybody or something? And then I'm like, oh, if I send a message to myself, I don't even get it. And so chatting with our carrier, it's like, oh, they just randomly decided, even though I had registered for the campaign registry, the 10 digit long codes, and, and I'm not even like at, at the volume, right, where I'm sending out like 50,000 messages or something, right? But they're like, oh, we, we, we just uh, categorized this. And uh, I mean, it's basically a black box and it's it's incredibly frustrating. So, you know, I, I can sympathize there, right? It, it's it 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 can be uh, very difficult to to operate in, especially you know for us. We, I, I could just send it from my own personal cell phone or do other stuff, right? Uh, but if you're sending thousands of messages, if they're mission critical, appointment reminders, whatever, like yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, but you know, I, oh, I, I, amen, I, hallelujah. Before you pivot off of that, Tom, like yes, right? My ultimate goal with reach: stop the unwanted calls and take the power back. From, from the carriers right now, everything the FCC has done is uh, is not only unconstitutional, lacks statutory support, it's a castle built upon sand, and every one of those blocks, uh, at least on the voice channel, is a violation of the Communications Act, there's a private right of action, and the carriers are going to get sued out of existence one day. Probably not, because we need the carriers too. But in seriousness, they've got to stop with this blocking. And the, even, even the determination that text messages are informational services, that doesn't survive scrutiny. All of that, all the entire call blocking regime has got to go. But before we can have the public support to fight that fight, we do have to stop the scourge of robocalls and the businesses need to be responsible. And that's what REACH is all about. But go ahead, you're going somewhere else. Well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll just share one. I mean, I, I'm kind of like indirectly at, you know, answering or addressing your, your, your question. You know, here, here's one of the other things that really frustrates me, right? And, and, and maybe because we don't operate like a traditional law firm or we don't, you know, we, we legit have the desire and motive to like stop these spammers. I mean, I've, I've reached out to the industry traceback group saying, hey, we've got these spoof calls here, you know, which which aren't as common now. I mean, uh, and really all that that's done is just call just cause the worst spammers to buy, you know, 10,000 phone numbers, use them for a month, let it sit for a month and then just, you know, rinse and repeat. Right. So, you know, they, they have to pay a little bit. But you know, you, you, you try to stop them in one way and like water, they'll just move to whatever, you know, the next easiest thing is. But what's what's really frustrating is like with the industry traceback group, I've reached out, hey, how, how could we collaborate? How, you know, we, we have these calls. It's like, no, we're just doing this ourselves, right? Like it, it, it's a closed system. You're, you're not welcome here. Um, and, and maybe to your point, you know, I look like small fish. I'm, you know, who, who's this guy? Let, let's not um, waste waste our time with him. And, and, and that's fine, right? I mean, I, I don't expect everybody to, to respond and, you know, give, give me all their time. But, um, you know, I, I, I like the thought. Um, I, I mean, I know one way where all businesses would, would clean up their act like immediately if there was strict liability. Uh, I know you wouldn't support that. But, I mean, you bet. There, there is strict liability. What do you mean? That's that's the current state of the law, man. It's strict liability for most offenses. If you were buying leads from a lead generator, saying any calls that are made on your behalf, you're strictly liable, as as opposed to vicariously liable. Uh, you, you mean taking out vicarious liability for the downstream leads? But I mean, the individual making the call remains directly and strictly liable. Yes, somebody that buys a lead, right, if they're an operating call center, of course, there's differences between call center leads, warrant transfers, and data leads, but, you know, your, your, your point is, I'm fine with your point, um, but I, I disagree. I don't think that's going to change, that wouldn't change any practice, because the people that are buying the leads are already trying to buy real, legitimate leads from real people that are really consented. That's what every contract says, right? So, you know, the, the folks that ultimately end up with the hot potato who get sued, right, the major brand, the direct consumer marketer, they're the innocent one in the entire flow. Although now, again, with reach, we're going to say, even though you're innocent from a certain perspective, you still do have a responsibility to try to impose, right, additional safeguards on those you're buying leads from. Uh, but let's, look, man, we're running long on this interview. I love this. You guys had so much great content, but I've got to wrap this um, because we're, we're frankly probably 10 minutes over already, but that's okay. Uh, so I'm going to end this with the same way I always end my interviews now for the new podcast. It, it, as you guys know, it's the Deserve to Win podcast. Tom, I know you love to win. I'm going to ask you guys both, though, right, for the people listening to my show, 
um, for the call centers in particular, the direct consumer marketers, the lead generators, the, the good guys, right? The guys that want to comply with the law. That's why they listen to the shows because they want to understand the law. You know, from your perspective, what can they do to stay out of your crosshairs, to not be dealing with Law HQ, and in short, what can they do to deserve to win? Well, I'll, I'll go first because Thomas will go longer, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting because, right, you, you had a you had a, somebody on maybe six months ago that said 45% of all leads are bad. I, I think his number is low. Um, so I think, you know, there are a lot of things. I, I don't find innocence as much as you do in people who buy leads because anyone who's buying leads right now knows that they're that 45 percent of them are bad because they all listen to your show. Um, you know, if, if you get better leads, you, you wouldn't have some of the problems. But what I have found and what we find on every level is everyone wants to push the envelope to the line and maybe pass. And I represented a lot of big businesses over time. And I would tell them, you can't do something. Like, well, that's not good for our business. I'm like, all right, then do it and get sued. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, you got to comply with the law and you're better off on the safe side of the law than you are on the gray side of the law. Yeah, I, I would just say, um... And if I'm talking to your clients, right, I, I think there's a universe of people who do telemarketing and, and there's a whole sub niche. That's a, probably redundant, a niche um, where they're, they're never going to hire you. They're never going to hire anyone. Right. And, and they don't care if they get sued. They don't care. They just ignore everything, which is so frustrating. Right. And I think addressing that is a different animal. But in terms of people who actually want to comply, right? It's like, well, implement the stuff to comply, right? So yes, reassign number, number database. If, if, if I mean, we we know we we have clients, we have cases where we can see they didn't check the reassign number database. I mean, the the low hanging fruit is already out there, and it's hard to say, oh. You know, oh, that was my bad. You know, sorry, and, and I'm not really sympathetic when it's like, look, here's really big issues that people are getting calls, and you know they don't want them. So yeah, reassign number database. Do not call registry. You know, if there's regulators listening, I I would say I, you know, one of the things I just hate. I think it's so stupid, so utterly stupid that the do not call registry. And the reassigned number database costs money. If they get billions of the FTC and the FCC gets billions of dollars in their budget or hundreds of millions, right? Whatever it is. And spam is the number one complaint people have. Well, gosh dang it, make it so easy for anyone who's calling to make sure they're complying, right? But, th but then you make it, I mean, have a website people can check. Yeah, maybe you got to create an account so you can, you know, see who's pinging the database, make a very simple API and it's free, right? There, there's no excuse. Like, let's make it so simple for people to comply. Now, you know, that would take legislation and stuff, but, um, and, and now I'm just uh, going on my, my soapbox. But, oh, Tom, yeah. you, you got a fantastic point. I don't know why that's never dawned on me. The reassigned number database and the DMC should absolutely be free. And what's more, I think it should be funded through the fines that the FCC and the FTC have leveled over the years. I think that would be incredible. Uh, we were talking earlier in the show about a $100 million fine that the FTC just uh, hit Vonage with. And they're going to use that money, apparently, to create some fund to give back the money to consumers, which in theory is great. But in reality, we know what's going to happen. It, it, it's going to end up a huge bureaucracy. The money's going to get blown. No one's going to get the real dollars. And it's just going to be a waste of time. You take that $100 million bucks. That would fund the DNC and the reassigned number database for 10 years, probably, right? Um, and I think that would be a fantastic use of time. All right, guys, we're out of time. Speaking of time, really, really appreciate you guys being on. You were a fantastic guest, and thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Wow. <laughs> uh, that was a lot. Okay, I'm sorry, first of all, to my listeners. That went a little longer than they usually go, but I just, I couldn't help myself. Those guys were so interesting. And like every 30 seconds, he kept saying something new and even more befuddling to me. And I mean, I liked the guy, but 
I don't know. I, I, my wheels are still spinning. I want to throw it around and get your guys' thoughts. I've got a few thoughts to close this thing out. Um, I'm going to start with you today, PJ. What did you think of uh, of the guys from Law HQ? Interesting. They are very uh, seem very dangerous. Dangerous? Yeah. They're going to like to hear that. Keep going. So uh, one of the interesting things that I, I saw, I really like people that preach what they do themselves, and it didn't seem like maybe his own stuff wasn't <laughs> that compliant with the reassigned numbers. <laughs> <laughs> just my opinion, <laughs> but I mean, well, now he, he did have a good point, right? That this stuff costs money, mm-hmm. and as I a business owner, I mean, you heard him. He's a business yeah. owner, so he's mm-hmm. got to think about where he's going to spend money, and where he's not. Look, he's completely right. As a small business, to pay twenty grand as a startup for the national DNC list, it's mm-hmm. it's absurd. He's he's absolutely right on that. So. But again, he's probably trying to save money himself. Yeah, it was funny because Jim kept talking about like advice he'd give to his clients about having to comply with the law. I felt like he was talking in code to Tom half the time. <laughs> you know, Tom, like you got to comply with the law, buddy. Um, let's throw it over to you, Tori, the dame. What do you th- What'd you think? I really like those guys. I mean, I get that they're dangerous. I really like that he wore a shirt that said, what is it, you can spam but you can't hide on mm-hmm. his debut on the Deserve to Win podcast. That's pretty good. I That's thought pretty that, good. Was, uh, that was nice. Of course, he made me look really bad. We talked at the top of the show about how you all, is henpecking an appropriate word? Made me wear a suit when I should have been wearing a t-shirt. And of course, of course, the guest then shows up. Uh, the guest then shows up wearing a t-shirt as if just to like, I don't know, exemplify, that's the wrong word, but just to make me look even worse, like more of a tool for wearing a, a suit on a podcast. But anyway, sorry, Tori, keep going. That's all I have. That's all you had? Yeah, you just thought they were cool and you liked the shirt. Thanks. Yeah. Rubbing, assaulting the wound right there is what that is. Uh, Britt, since I'm looking this direction, what would you think? I thought they were pretty interesting. I mean, what... Would you would you swipe left on them? Or are they <laughs> or, or right? What's the... Um, maybe I wouldn't swipe. I'd just keep them, you know... In the, in, the <laughs> yeah, in the queue. Wait, is that an option? Yeah, I don't apparently. Know. Okay, fair enough. I don't know. Um, but it's interesting to hear about their app and how all that how how all that works. So maybe I might download it or something. Yeah, check actually, it out. I think she's going to download this. So guys, be careful because I know you're not running the R and D, and I know you know Brittany's going to infiltrate, and uh, the Baroness is going to be in your system. <laughs> swiping right, yeah. Swiping, swiping right or left. Who knows? Uh, that's all you had. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Um, good show today, by the way. Uh, uh, Pooja, what did you think? Let's close out. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to note was this is yet another plaintiff's attorney that showed up on the podcast with a marketing background. If you recall, when Bacon was on, he gave me a bacon feel, right? Um, now I'm hungry. But, um, <laughs> he, 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 you know, because Adrian Bacon had a real robust marketing background before he became a serious plaintiff's attorney in the TCPA space. So uh, interesting to keep in mind for you defense folks or folks who are our clients because these guys know what they're talking about from the marketing space, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, to uh, his point about compliance being so expensive. I mean, this is something I battled with when I was in-house all the time, right? Well, you, you want me to comply with the law, then why is it so damn expensive? Short answer, because Eric Trotman is not any cheaper. So, you know. I try like, to make myself as expensive yeah, as possible. It, it, yeah, it, it is unfortunate that a lot of the compliance solutions out there or the ones that are required, like the reassigned number database, are so expensive. But, you know, that's something that we can't help with. And, you know, we're on your side. We agree it's expensive. It's just it has to get done. You, I mean, and yet another plaintiff's attorney that says there's no excuse for not having the reassigned number database scrub well, implemented. So thank you for that, Queenie. Mm-hmm. So I've got a couple of things. First, uh, it wasn't so bad to wear the suit. Y'all were right. It was okay. And I guess I do look shockingly handsome. Um, but, it, it, but in seriousness, uh, there was, I, got a, I took a lot away from that. I, I mean, one of the things I think that was the biggest line in my head was when he said, sure, we've got thousands of clients, but we want hundreds of thousands or millions of clients. Uh, and you heard that guy, right? I mean, he's a fella that doesn't like to lose. He reminds me a lot of me, right? The way he kept talking about how driven he is. He doesn't sleep. He's constantly thinking about things. And that's me, right? I mean, I, I'm going 15 hours a day. If I'm awake and I'm not playing with my kids, I'm thinking about the law, right? That's it. That's all I'm doing. Um, and he kind of had that vibe, which is why, PJ, I agree. That guy does seem pretty dangerous. Uh, this guy's got some staying power, and I would not be surprised if he sticks around for, for quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I will say that the, the reason I brought him on the show is he actually was, was very – he's like one of the first people to reach out on the plaintiff side and say, I want in on reach, right? He's a believer. He understands that businesses need to be responsible. We can't just now keep this narrative of we don't know any better because, I mean, you heard Jim, right? The plaintiff's bar is onto it too. 45% of leads are fraudulent, guys. Like, 
this this narrative now is starting to ring a little hollow. And I'm a defense lawyer, for mm-hmm. God's sake, right? I mean, we've got to be smarter. We've got to show the regulators that we are trying to do the right thing uh, as a whole, as a, an entire industry. Um, and we got to do right by consumers. And ultimately, we have to do right by ourselves. Um, so I, I was glad to have him on the show from that perspective. There's just a lot the guy said. And like I said, my, my wheels are still kind of spinning a little bit. Um, but I did enjoy the way the guy just shriveled up. There was a there was a, a commercial many years ago. It was I think it was a Sprite commercial where it was like you know you, you should you should go for quality not like for hype. And they were making a, a fake movie. It was like a satire of like a movie set for like the you know a giant squid not a squid you know one of those uh, <laughs> what do you call those things like a snail a slug right and it was like a pack <laughs> of the slugs and it had slug tacos right and the and the line was you put a you know, put salt on them they shrink right because it like yeah. shrivels up right yeah. that's what the guy did he, like shriveled up like he was a slug that you put some taco <laughs> when you put a little salt on when he was talking about TCPA compliance because this is every business owner knows what I'm talking about and that's why I create this podcast that's why I share this information that's why I try to empower people because it's really fascinating the people that are most empowered by this show are people who generally have a lot of power right it's CEOs chief operating officers heads of compliance legal attorneys people who are very powerful but when you get to the TCPA world you know you're nothing special here right this this is the real show uh, and in order to really understand what um, your risks are and how to be compliant you've got to stick around and of course that's why we have the deserve to win podcast and why I ask guys like Tom how can you deserve to win uh, so I hope that you folks enjoyed this I know this interview went a little long uh, but a great show today and I got through it in a suit I, I might throw up a poll at the end of this thing should the, the czar wear suits in the future or go back to his patented black t-shirt look we'll talk about that next week thanks everybody Bye. Bye.